It was a quiet moment in the hectic weekend schedule of downtown Chicago. The day trippers had already left, but the dinner and theater crowd had not yet arrived. That calm was shattered at precisely two minutes to five o'clock when a massive tractor trailer came barreling up State Street at breakneck speed. The cargo door was wide open, exposing 87 large cartons of Bing cherries to the crisp November air. The 18-wheeler squealed to a halt in front of the Balsam Auditorium, and out of the back leaped Max Carmody. His normally messy hair had been so blown around by the wind that it stood on end as if he had been filled with static electricity. He hit the ground running. I'm here! Maud jumped out of the cab in hot pursuit. Her red allergic rash slightly faded. I'm right behind you, Max. Olivia was next. Maud, wait for me. Livy, come back, Mrs. Plunkett tried in vain to rein in her young daughter. She gave her husband a quick kiss. You were a real hero today, Mario. Sorry about the truck. I hope the cherries don't spoil. They'll be fine, he reassured her. I'll take the northern route. There's a cold front dipping down from Canada. He hopped back up to the cab and called, Break a leg, Max. Right before the heavy brass doors of the Balsam Auditorium, Max froze. The time pressure was unbelievable. It was 90 seconds to five, yet there was something that he had that had to be said. It was probably too late anyway, but Max couldn't have made it there, would have had no chance at all, had it not been for his stepfather. The guy had driven hours out of his way and risked an expensive perishable cargo just to get Max to Chicago. It was more loyalty than Max could have expected from anybody, and a heck of a lot more than he had the right to expect from Mario, someone he'd never been very nice to. He turned to face his stepfather, who was just about to pull away from the curb. Hey, Mario, do the Vols have any home games coming up? Mario grinned. Next Wednesday, a grudge match with Caveman Agrondek and the Mansfield Mayhem. Save me a ticket, yelled Max, and blasted through the auditorium doors. He didn't even hear the, can I help you, son, from the man in the glass booth. It was five o'clock on the nose, but these things never finished on time, right? There was still a chance. There had to be. He plowed blindly through the velvet curtain and pounded down the aisle between the packed rows of seats toward the spotlit stage. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for, the MC was announcing, the judges have reached their decision. The funniest kid in America is, kettle drums built to a dramatic crescendo, Barry Robson. All the steam went out of Max, and he coasted to a stop on the red carpet. He was amazed he didn't fall flat on his face. Barry Robson. The name ricocheted around his head like an accelerated particle as his stomach tied itself into a knot worthy of an Eagle Scout. Barry Robson, the funniest kid in America, not Max Comedy, not Max Carmody. He watched through his eyes, though his eye, through eyes filling up with tears, as an ecstatic young teen ran on stage to accept a large trophy featuring a gleaming silver microphone. His disbelief melted into despair. They had gone through so much today, getting lost, the breakdown, Maud's allergy attack, Mario's busted cooling unit, Yet, against all odds, they had made it to Chicago and the Balsam Auditorium, but not in time. The contest was over. Their motel was a pleasant little roadside inn on the outskirts of Chicago, but not even the cheery rooms and 140 cable channels could brighten the deep, dark depression that had settled over Max Carmody. One at a time, his traveling companions tried to lighten his mood. I'll watch you do your act any time you want, Olivia offered generously. You can even make fun of Barney. Forget it, kid, her brother muttered. After today, I'm through with the comedy business. I'm never going to tell another joke as long as I live. Mrs. Plunkett was next. Well, the cherries are safe and the truck is fixed, she reported. Mario just called in from Montauk, Iowa. Did you know that's the home of the world's largest fire hydrant? Uh-huh. His mother regarded him expectantly. Don't you have anything to add to that, Maxie? If I still made jokes, which I don't, 
Max replied. Then I might say that I hope the dogs in that town are all ten feet tall, but that would be funny, and there's nothing funny about my life right now. Last came Maud. She waited until Mrs. Plunkett and Olivia had retired to the girls' room next door. You think this is bad? she challenged. This is nothing. Try walking a mile in my shoes, and I don't mean just because of the orthotic insoles for flat feet. I'm the world's largest fire hydrant, pal, and there's a lot of dogs out there, of all sizes. Max looked daggers at her. It's reassuring to know that, after everything you ha that, that happened today, this is really all about you. He pointed to the door. Get out of here. I want to be alone. What about TV? Maud switched on the set and deposited herself on one of the beds. Your mom would never let me watch Chicago news in front of Olivia. The big city crime is way better than the wimpy stuff that happens at home. In Bartonville, breaking news in Katie, is Katie Kate sobbing because somebody backed over a caterpillar. As Maud drank in stories of fires, armed robberies, and high-speed police chases, Max barely heard a word. For two whole months, every fiber of his being had been focused on this contest. Now it was over, and without his firing off so much as a single punchline, it was like losing a war before you could pick up a pea shooter in your own defense. And on top of it all, Max now had a date with Mario to see Caveman Ogrondek and his merry Neanderthals. It was the end. It was more than he could bear. Hey, look, Maud pointed at the screen. They're talking about your contest. Max picked up the remote and hit mute. I'm not listening. There's the guy who won, she went on. Hey, that's a nice trophy. She reached for the clicker. Come on, let's listen to the acceptance speech. No. Max tried to yank the remote away, but Maud grabbed on. There was a brief tug of war, and then the sound returned. The winner's standing ovation. For Max, it was a hammer blow to the heart. The applause died away, and the anchor returned. There was one additional award, although for some reason, this young comic never got to perform. The chief judge explains. On screen, the contest official was being interviewed backstage. We didn't plan on this, but we got a video that you just can't ignore. The whole committee made copies because it's something you want to keep forever. It's the funniest bit I've ever seen. If you're out there, Max Comedy, you've got a great future. Max froze as his audition video began to play right there on the Chicago News. There was Max, larger than life, on the stage of the Bartonville Middle School gym, as Big Bird had filmed with a month earlier. Him, had filmed him a month earlier. In our school cafeteria, he began his routine. The black bean burrito has been designated a weapon of mass destruction. Holding his breath, Max waited for his laugh track to kick in, and yes, there was a huge reaction, but it was not the howls of mirth he had taped at the lock party. The sound that swelled through the TV's small speaker was horrible, violent, animal. <gasps> Maud's jaw fell open. What's that? How would you describe it? A frantic, agonized combination of moaning, howling, and shrieking, almost mooing? Max exclaimed in disbelief. Yeah, Maud snapped her fingers in sudden recognition. I haven't heard anything like that since your dad gave birth to that cow. Strictly speaking, dad had delivered the calf. He was the vet, not the mother. But Max never said this out loud, because at that instant, everything became crystal clear to him in a flash of sudden, amazing, and terrible understanding. It is that cow, Max rasped, awestruck. Somehow, in the planned dome barn that night, I must have turned on my tape machine by mistake and recorded Madonna giving birth over my laugh track. Maud was bewildered. But why didn't you listen to it before dubbing it into the audition tape? I couldn't, Max lamented. My dad lost the tape machine before I woke up the next morning, and by the time I got it back, Mario was leaving, and the computer speakers were broken, and I can't believe it. They watched as Max went through his entire act, with each joke being greeted by wild mooing. He had timed it perfectly on the computer. Every last... Every blast of bovine labor came exactly where the audience response should have been. 
given a real laugh track and not a recording of a livestock blessed event, he would have succeeded 100%. He cradled his head in trembling hands. This is bad. This is worse than bad. I'd need a million percent improvement to get this up to bad. What are you talking about? asked Maud, listening intently. You're a smash. As the audition tape played, the news anchor, sports reporter, weatherman, and the entire studio crew could be heard howling in the background. I'm a joke, Max amended miserably. The audience is supposed to laugh with you, not at you. When it was finally over, the anchor was wiping tears from her eyes as she struggled to regain her composure for the rest of the broadcast. Max Comedy, ladies and gentlemen, she managed. Remember that name, coming soon to a barnyard near you. See, moaned, uh, moaned Max, I'm a laughing stock. At least it's just in Chicago, Maud offered in consolation. Nobody knows you around here anyway. The phone rang. Max answered it. Oh, hi, Dad, he said listlessly. How's the car? Dr. Carmody was in a state of excitement. I got home an hour ago, but never mind that. Listen, Max, what went on at the contest? I just took a, I just took a call from a guy named Frank Lugnett, who saw you on TV. Really? Max was confused. How does Mr. Lugnett get Chicago TV all the way in Bartonville? He says he saw you on CNN. According to him, your tape is on all the comedy channels, too. What happened? Did you win that contest? Not exactly, Max said shakily, but I guess people kind of like my audition video. Like it? Max's father was almost shouting now. The man wouldn't shut up about how great you are. He owns the Giggle Factory, and he wants to hire you to perform. He says you're the funniest kid in America.